Hi, my name is Sophie. I am a Canadian who lives on stolen land. I want to acknowledge the fact that I live on Iroquois territory. I'm about 30 kilometers from what used to be the territory of the Mohawk of the Bay of Quinney, which is Treaty Number Three and a Half that was signed in 1793. Hello, everyone. Today I wanted to do something special to bring awareness about Orange Shirt Day or the Truth and Reconciliation Day. So I had the pleasure to sit down with my good friend Amanda Francis, who is a Mi'kmaq from New Brunswick. So I really hope you learn a few things. You will find in the description below a few references to different books that you can read to learn about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and also about the Indigenous history and all the events that led to what's going on today. So I'm really hoping you're going to enjoy this. I think you're going to learn a few things and my list is not exhaustive. It's just like my favorite music, my favorite books, and a few uh, companies that I like to support. So thank you for watching. This is Amanda, Amanda Francis, and um, I am Micmac from Elzebukta, New Brunswick is where my dad is from, and my okay. mom is from South Branch, New Brunswick. So my mom is Irish, and my dad is Micmac, and I grew up off reserve till I was like in my 20s we'll say so my parents were together from the time I like from my, when I was born till I was 12 and during that time we spent a lot of time like going to my grandparents house on the weekend like on the reserve and I was a book yep. which was called Big Cove then and you know I was close with my family then everything like that then once they split up there was a period of time when I was a teenager and like you know all teenagers why well, was had issues and things and I think you know um and uh I had a anger a lot of my anger was directed I think mostly towards my dad which later in life was not exactly fair I you know discovered as you grow older you see things more clearly I think so um you know I went through school went to university in university I started discovering more about um you know what it was to be a native person because during that time I was very disconnected like okay. the time that of being a teenager after they broke up I would only go to like my grandparents for birthdays or funerals weddings things like that so I had a big disconnect there for a while so then I remember I did a project uh for um a drama class and we had to like produce a play on um paper and I did the ecstasy of Rita Joe. and what as I was doing that um it really I started to like look more at my family, look more of what it meant to be a native person and everything like that. And I started to reconnect a little bit. I, you know, I started talking to my dad again because there was a time I didn't even talk to my dad. So I started talking to my dad again and learning more about my family. Oh, Finished university, went, I lived in Winnipeg for a while, came back. So around the time I was 27 years old, I had a good, I had a good relationship with my dad you know, back to having a relationship with my family, everything like that. I also felt like the things that I uh, learned at university, because it was, you know, paid for, my education was paid for, that I should give back to where I was from, like to Big Cove, to Elzebukta. So I did um, as much as I could, like I was a supply teacher, which I was like, not a great supply teacher, I don't think. <laughs> People always say, oh, you should be a teacher. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so then from there, uh, around the time I was 27, I started to, uh, I had kind of like a break, you know what I mean? Like things were too much in my life and I 
had a little break, we'll say. So that's when I started to, then once that break was over, <laughs> uh, I felt like I had like an experience with um, like this green light came to me. And after that, that light came to me, I just knew everything was going to be okay. Like I was in such a mess. And then I, one day I was a mess and the next day I was okay after I had that experience. And so I told this to my aunt, like this was a few months later. And my aunt was like, oh, you need to talk to William. That's her husband. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I started going to sweat lodge ceremonies. And when I went in there and I realized it just felt like home, like everything made sense again. Never mind again for the first time. <laughs> and so, so I continued, like I would go twice a week to sweats and, you know, gave up any, well, I would never really did drugs, but like, and I wasn't really even a big drinker, but I didn't, you know, you have to give those things up if you're going to follow the red road. And that was fine. I did that. And I've been on that road ever since. And um, after two years, I, you know, became a sun dancer and just really embraced um, being a native person and found going from having that disconnect and being like really disconnected. And in a way, like we talk about privilege, stuff like that. During that time, I was definitely living a life more as a non-native person than, you know, embracing um, the native side, but I did still, I would still once in a while um, be identified as a native person and experience, you know, different racial things and whatnot. Like, but I have to say, I didn't really, I, I wouldn't experience it more than somebody who is not, like, I would have more privilege than somebody who would be darker or somebody who would be more identified as a native person. So, I have to, you know, acknowledge that as well, that I do experience some privilege just from the way I look or maybe the way I talk. I don't know, things like that, which is not really fair, but it is, you know, the way, the way it goes, but I do experience it both ways. Was it, were, and that's sort of, were there times when you were younger that you felt discrimination? Um, yeah, it's funny. It's not funny, but I can remember like when you're young, you're so innocent and, and, resilient and you really, don't. yeah, you're not like exposed to like the prejudice of the, of your parents or of your, but when I was in grade, I think it was grade two or grade three, I had a birthday party and I lived, like I said, I lived off the reserve. I lived up country and, um, I was having a birthday party and pretty much everybody from my class was invited. It was like, we were going bowling. My dad had a projector. We were watching a movie. And um, I had like, I had a lot of friends and there was this one girl and she was not allowed to come to my party. And I think because like, we're so young and innocent, she told me like, right out, it's because you're Indian. Her parents told her like, you know, that she was not allowed to go to my house. Well, it wasn't her parents, it was her mom. Her mom was a single mom. And she was the only, she was the only one. She was my good friend. She stayed my good friend all through high school and everything like that. But I don't, I didn't forget it. Like, you know what I mean? Like that, that habit. And that was really the first thing that I really remember that I was like, well, I couldn't understand it. You know, like, what the heck? <laughs> So, but yeah, that was the first thing that I really remember. Yeah. But she, it wasn't her fault. And she never held that, you know, she never held that judgment, but her mom did clearly yeah, it work. And I and think that's I, the thing. Just, tr just try, like, just get to know a native person. You know what I mean? Like, like in that case, that girl, her mom, like, well, I know she worked in a store in town. So maybe if she had, you know, I don't know, she was just closed, you know, just closed to, to that. I, I don't know. I don't know what she thought was going to happen. <laughs> like, uh, we we're going bowling. We we're going to have hot dogs. <laughs> but I mean, like, listen, I think the best example, did, did you watch Yellowstone? Oh, well, I'm on uh, the middle of season two. 
not all the way. You're about at the same spot that I am, but I caught like a few like random episodes and towards the end, Casey's wife, the indigenous girl, the beautiful indigenous girl mm -hmm. goes into a shop in, in town and she is so discriminated. Okay. Like to the point where they accuse her of stealing stuff and then she calls Beth. Oh my God. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Oh, I can't anyway. wait. I'm not there yet. I can't wait. Okay. <laughs> I, I want to say more. <laughs> You're going to love it. Anyway. I will say, uh, my aunt and her husband, when they would go shopping in the States to Walmart, they make a joke. Of, and that's one of the things, regardless of everything happening and that has happened to us, laughter is the biggest medicine you know so they always make a joke like they go to walmart in the states and she always knows where he is because they'll say security aisle nine and she'll be like oh okay that's where he is <laughs> and he's like he's our spiritual leader you know and he's the most honest wonderful never did uh, alcohol and drugs in his life incredible man would never steal anything he'd give you everything he has <laughs> rather than steal something and but always always uh security aisle nine or whatever they'll be like oh that's where they he must be over aisle nine we'll go there <laughs> and as a white person sometimes i feel uncomfortable asking questions or kind of like you know being more forward because i think there's still a lot of pain related to that there's a lot of like anger and pain not addressed to me but addressed to yeah. many generations of white people abusing indigenous people in this I country think, right and my uncle i'll say my uncle william nevin <laughs> he he's our spiritual leader and he says it like in a good way in that when we talk about reconciliation and healing it's not just us there's both sides have to reconcile and heal and part of that is like like what you've done like admit that there there was and is a problem and that a lot of the things like um happening today are it's just a result of all that that's where systemic racism was is born it's born in those violent acts but it lives in denial you know like people denying that these things happened or did not or just saying I oh, get over it like you know like okay was there a was there a graveyard at your school like <laughs> come on you know what I mean like let's let's be real and honest and yeah the healing has to happen on both sides and, you're, and I you're think the healing that. and I think also that, like I've watched like um like a little piece done on like an art, like a retired RCMP officer who actually was involved in the 60s school. And it was like, he didn't really have a choice because back then mm -hmm. that was the way it was. Mm -hmm. And I think the guy, like he was probably in his late seventies at this point. And I, you could feel the pain in the way he was talking about it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's and I do understand there's, there's no just, and what baffles me is I'm 46 and I was an history buff when I was in high school I don't rem I and I I maybe I have a selective memory I don't remember anything about indigenous being like you know no. sent to residential schools or the whole thing with the the 60s scoop scoop and I mean like I think it's mm -hmm. It baffles me the fact that up until 1997 there were still residential schools mm -hmm. open mm -hmm. and I don't remember hearing anything about that what is your biggest hope for the future when it comes um, to truth and reconciliation everything that's happening right now I I have I'm really concerned about every like I'm really happy that there's everything that's happening now and everything like that. What I'm concerned about is that the new history is 
like new history books and things like that in schools, what's happening with the curriculum, everything like that, that the, that it's not, it's not more non-natives teaching us about our history. You know what I mean? Like, I think that they, the books should be written by native people. You know, Native people should be involved in what is going on. What, like, what are you presenting in the curriculum? Are you, like, I even, I see it now. There'll be like, they'll take the teachers and do a workshop and teach the teachers how to make dream catchers. And then the teachers are teaching the kids how to make dream catchers. So in a way it's good. And in another way, it's like, well, they're not really going to get a hundred percent. I don't even, I'm not. I'm just using dream catchers as an example. No, no, but I know where you're going. But you know like what I what, mean? Like to mean? get the heart of it, like the spirit of what you're doing, you need a native person to do it. I believe because there's a difference. You know what I mean? Like if I know how to make, I don't know. You know what I mean? If it's something like that, even or if it's get like somebody, get an indigenous person yes. to come do the workshop in class with the and kids do it with themselves in the class yes and do it themselves because i know that um yeah they'll be they'll do workshops for medicine bags okay so the teachers go in and learn how to do medicine bags and then they teach the students well it's not the same thing like are they learning that you're not supposed to touch medicine if you haven't been clean and sober for four days you know like uh you're not supposed to touch medicine if you're on your moon time like are the, do the teachers are they getting those are they getting all that? these nuances that are very important that makes They're the whole ceremony important. so important yeah yes and like if you're making a medicine bag it is a ceremony you know if you're if you're different like just those kind of things that I feel are so important because I know that um I know it's happened in the past that teachings are given and if you're out of school like okay oh, well we can't tell people that they can't do drugs and alcohol to you know we can't tell people that well why not that's the teaching <laughs> that's the real thing <laughs> like you're, you shouldn't be making a drum if you're on your moon time like or using a drum or all these different kind of things and and there's a lot of teachings and yes some people have different teachings than what I have being a, a sun dancer but to me, like, to me, it's really important, you know, and because I know, I know one of our biggest teachings is if you're doing drugs and alcohol, your spirit goes away from you. You know, your spirit is not a hundred percent with you. And if you're doing something as important as, you know, using your medicine or all these things, you, you have to approach it in your whole self. You know, your whole being has to be there. So like, it's like, to me, that's something that's very important, but it's not just that. I think just in general, the teaching needs to come from native people. Like the textbooks need native people involved in the writing of them. Um, and then providing you know, the, the information. All of it. Yes, all of it. And not, not for like, to me, I, I would do it for free. Like, don't, you know what I mean? Like, I would rather have people doing it. Well, I mean, people are going to want to be, but when money starts getting involved with things, I find that, okay, now, now this is my job, say. So now you're paying me and okay. Now you're saying, oh, I can't tell people that you can't use drugs and alcohol. And now I, I have to follow this because this is my job. And now you're my boss. And now you're telling me this. So now are the real teachings coming through? Or there is the real story coming out? Is that how, how it didn't get told in the first place? You know what I mean? Like, oh, no, we can't tell people that there's people buried outside the school. We're going to talk about residential school, but we're not going to talk about that. You know. When even you knew there were kids <laughs> buried all over the place. Yeah. Like even in, um, cause all over Canada and probably the United States too, there's researching now and trying to find, are there children there or, you know, is there, 
is there on Mark Graves and everything like that. And I know in Nova Scotia, um, I know different people who work with um, survivors and who've heard stories and everything like that. Um, and like the truth and reconciliation and everything. And there's like a, a lake there and they, they're wondering if they're gonna dread, they're gonna you know, drain that. Are they gonna look there? Because survivors already know that there's stuff there. There's not stuff, but there's probably remains and all different kinds of things. And, there, and there's all the different little places that they know because they've heard the stories you know, they're from their parents and their grandparents of things that happen and that the, they've heard of like babies going in incinerators, things like that. Those are real stories. Those, re those things really happened and those, those have been passed down. But if you're, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like I, the, all the real, the, that's why it's truth and reconciliation you know, and that's what concerns me. Um, that's, that's what concerns me is that the truth part doesn't all come out, you know, because I think in healing, you need that truth for both sides. Like, you know, so then if the truth is there, then, okay, well, now we can work on healing and reconciliation. Should be truth healing and reconciliation you know what i mean like the healing part needs to be in there as well but do you think it can happen yeah. um i think so you know what i mean even if it's just one person at a time even what you're doing you know that's a step right there you know you being true you telling your truth of how you feel about everything that's happening um and one of the things i was thinking about this year this year for me Oh, I'm just gonna move. The back to back to school was hard because I saw a lot of um, parents talking about like native and non-native, mostly non-native that I was thinking about uh, getting their kids ready for university, you know, and driving them there. And oh, my child is gone, and here they are. They're you know mostly adults, even like eight, 17, 18, 19 years old packing their kids up, taking them to university and leaving them there and coming home. And they're not there and crying for a couple of days. And it was hard because I wanted to say something more than once, but I didn't want to offend anybody or take away what they were experiencing. But I thought like, and I cried a lot because I was thinking, what about those parents whose children were just taken they were pretty much and babies. And they were babies. Yeah. Four, five, six, seven years old. They're taken. And maybe they've already heard stories. Nine chances out of ten they've heard stories. Maybe their neighbor, neighbor's child didn't come home from school the previous year. You know, they were lost. So then they come and they take these children. And then, then they're left their children are not there so and I just wanted to just if you're wondering about residential school and and everything like that think about the feelings you had when your child went off to prep school university even just regular school like you get a pang like when your child leaves you know after you've been with them all that time like you feel a little empty but imagine what those parents felt like that's what that's why I had a hard time with back to school this year just because because then you're really at that point where you have those feelings because you're having those feelings but imagine them amplified like you know a thousand times to what those parents were feeling like their child was leaving and they didn't know if they would ever see them again and some of them never did like and sometimes the one that they saw back they were com they were transformed into well like, yeah into mm -hmm. nothing pretty much mm -hmm. probably not Haircut, talking yeah not speaking or in you know mother language and mm -hmm. everything yeah and there was nothing the parents could do like there was no because you're do. you're an indian you're nothing mm -hmm. i think some parents probably 
hid hid their children things like that did whatever they could to try to stop it and um yeah so it was hard and only but at the same time then i just you know pray prayed more for everything and again mostly when i pray like about the everything with residential schools and reconciliation everything like that it's more the truth that i that i ask for you know from creator the good spirits i pray for more of the truth because that's the only way that's the only way forward is with the truth and the acceptance of the truth you know like the acceptance of the truth and i think like that's why i'm so thankful like for you and everything that you do because you do a lot and you do a lot of research. Like I said the other day, like you probably know more websites to direct people to for sure than I do. You know what I mean? Like, so, I mean, that's, that's awesome to uh, be. And that's what, that's what's needed is more allies. Like you have a platform that you can put uh, this out and lots of people see it. And lots of people say, oh, well, Sophie is looking at this. I'm going to look at this too what is this you know well, there 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 are a few people that i follow and i get even like you know informations from there's an amazing person in pei her name is danielle white she's a maker too she knits a little bit she paints she has like mm -hmm. an etsy shop and everything but she is a big advocate she's a really good ally and i ask her a lot of questions because mm -hmm. at this point Settlers need to find white allies to maybe kind of stop the reoccurrence of like re -trauma re traumatizing people, mm -hmm. which is I think the big the big thing. Mm -hmm. I think you guys are tired. You're emotionally exhausted. We have to come up and you know within ourselves the ones that know and the ones that have been exposed like danielle lived in in winnipeg and and she mm -hmm. knows what the reality in in um manitoba is and i mean like yeah mm -hmm. i don't have i don't have the answer for everything but i can tell you i try as much as i can if i don't have an answer i'll research i'll ask around and mm -hmm. and try to yeah, be that's fantastic mm -hmm. and i think to me that's 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 how that's how it's gonna repair with just one person at a time that's how it's gonna be that's the that's only all we can do yeah but if this one person like is working in policing and that touches that person well maybe it's gonna make a change something there or if that person is working in government well, maybe it's going to affect some change there. Or if that person is working in a grocery store, maybe it's going to affect some change there. You know what I mean? Like, maybe they won't be calling my uncle on, uh, you know, the security cameras. <laughs> like, you know, because take, take, take the time and see. Like, he's an incredible person. Just like, you know, anybody else, I'm sure that's being called on the security camera. But laughter i find like especially uh, in like i only know like well maybe other tribes but in the micmac tribe for sure you know joking around and laughter that's how that's how we get through things that's how we you know move forward is you know pray ask creator for help laugh enjoy the day always find something positive in the day you know you're amazing oh you too <laughs> amanda i'm so glad that we had this conversation i really wanted to do something Yay. eventually i can hug you in person oh my gosh oh, that'll yeah. be so awesome i'm rocking my other okama Woo! sweatshirt oh that's the crew neck nice yes. oh the other one that turquoise one is beautiful it's so nice i know he's pretty he's pretty awesome actually Mm -hmm. I'm really excited for the new collection to come and out. I'm rocking my uh, sister's yeah. design here. I'm going to be wearing it on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Loud and proud. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you, thank thank you. you for providing this this platform, this, you know, chance to That's have why. this conversation. With, 
with my mini following, maybe like, you know, yeah, even it just touch a few people. Yeah, right. That's the and that's the way I think just little one person at a time who Make a little catch bit of a, a and spark. eventually maybe, maybe by the end of my lifetime or yours, things will get better. Who knows? Oh, yeah. I think like that's why, you know, when I was doing those uh, conversations with Shaheen, I always like shouted out to the knitters because I find like there are quite a few um, of us that are interested and we know each other. We already have a common bond. So, you know, we, we want to be interested in the things that are affecting our fellow knitters and whatnot. So, yeah. Hi, community. Big, yeah, we're we community. Rock. Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it's good to see, too, you know, like, it's like a, even Orange Shirt Day. It reminds me of Gigi, too, and her story. Because the story of Orange Shirt Day, you know, uh, Phil, the lady Phyllis, who... Um, her grandmother had saved up money for her to have a new outfit to go back to school. And I apologize if I get it wrong in any way, but then she went off to mission school and they took, they stripped her down and they took her, her, she was so excited to go to school. And this orange was an exciting color for her. And, and they just stripped her down of it. And now, you know, where I, I'm sure on Thursday we're gonna see a, a sea of orange. orange, yeah. And I hope that that helps Phyllis to heal, you know, somewhat in her heart what happened to her, you know. Well, I will tell you one last story before we end this. So I don't know if you know, but during the pandemic, I got a new addiction called quilting. <laughs> So there is an indigenous girl. I think she is in the Sudbury or Timmins area. And she started not a really an organization, but kind of a co-op where people can provide either finished quilts or blocks. And then she'll put them together and she will give them to survivors who make their requests. Wow. So I'll put information like like I said before, I'm gonna put a bunch of information in the description, whether it's you know, organization you can support or indigenous businesses, music you can listen to, books you can read, or if you're like somebody like me who cannot like, you know, keep my attention on one thing for a long period of time, like reading. Well, you can listen to it. So, <laughs> um, my uncle, have I told you about my uncle's book? Did I give you the link? I think Maybe so. It was somebody else. If not, I'll give you the link. It's William Nevin and Jesse Morris. So, that's a book that I really believe that should be for sure in universities, if not in high schools, as part of the curriculum, because it's incredible. You know, it's his story and it's just an eye opening, wonderful book and uh yeah if you would include that i would be very grateful well, <laughs> it's on amazon will, for sure. it's yeah it's on amazon and kindle i think and yeah so this there's a book on some people like i don't have the 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 attention span to be able to read the entire truth and Re reconciliation commission oh yeah no <laughs> but there is a book that actually is kind of a condensed okay point of everything with the explanation for the 94 calls for action so people can understand what that means for indigenous people in canada mm -hmm. so yeah that's Amanda, wonderful. your time was precious i thank you from the bottom of my heart thank you i can't wait to hug someday <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>